This video is a recording of a presentation that I gave at the Bluff Body Aerodynamics and its Applications Conference in Birmingham in July 2024. At the conference, it was part of the after dinner speech. The presentation is very much the same as I gave on that occasion, although I have taken out one or two parts that were associated with a, a competition I ran during the course of the presentation for those present. The presentation is entitled The Oldest World Record Throwing the Cricket Ball. On page 1403 of the latest version of Wisdom, we come to the miscellaneous records section, throwing the cricket ball. Robert Percival at the Durham Sands Racecourse, County Durham, 140 yards, two feet in 1882. And for those of you who don't know what the units are, a yard is about 0.9 of a meter, a foot about 0.3 of a meter. I think it fair to say that the general reaction to that record is really, was it actually possible? And there's a great deal of scepticism about whether it was possible or not. Is it credible? Was that throw possible? And that's what I'm going to address in the presentation. I'll start off by talking a little bit about the game of cricket for any of you watching who don't know anything about it. Um, then about the event throwing the cricket ball. Then about Robert Percival, the potential world record holder. Then about the Durham Sands event, then I'll ask the question, was the throw possible? So let's start with the game of cricket. Cricket began 250 years ago, at least in the south of England. Uh, it, it's basically a bat and ball game uh, that the ball is propelled towards a wicket, a set of wooden stumps, and that wicket has to be protected by the bat and the ball has to be hit as far as possible. Uh, it's evolved a little bit since then, uh, and now it is a worldwide sport. Bowling, uh, propelling the ball, is very much a, uh, a skill. It has because the ball actually can move about quite significantly in the air. Uh, batting similarly is a skill, and the best batsmen and batswomen um, can score many tens, hundreds of runs on any one occasion. It's a sport that's played around the world and there you can see the, the grounds at Lon in London, in Melbourne, Durban, in Kabul and in Kolkata and particularly in Melbourne and Kolkata the crowds can be absolutely huge. So it's an international game. One of the best descriptions I've ever heard of it um, was by a colleague who didn't know anything about cricket at all, who finally referred to it as like baseball with just two bases, which it is fair enough, I suppose. In 1880, when we're talking about the, the event, cricket in England was very much a sport that was played by gentlemen, a game for gentlemen amateurs. Um, and um, it was played by public schoolboys, by those in the upper reaches of society. International cricket started when the Australians came across, sent the team across in 1880. The cricket ball with which we'll be concerned is about five ounces in, uh, in weight, 150 grams. Uh, it's small, obviously, and can be held in the hand. The crucial thing about it is that it has a seam around it, uh, and this seam is used to attach the two halves of the ball together, and that seam, we'll see, has certain aerodynamic consequences. So, throwing the cricket ball. In the early years, throwing the cricket ball was a popular sports day event in the 19th century, with others such as place kicking, uh, drop kicking, uh, throwing at the wicket, and so on. The earliest mention of the event was in 1792, when Mark Richmond, gatekeeper to the Duke of Richmond, threw 119 yards at Goodwood Park to defeat the Earl of Winchelsea, who had never before been beaten. 
the game of gentlemen amateurs and their men, of course, their servants. In early years of the 19th century, competitions were often the subject of wages between these gentlemen. You can plot the sort of winning distances in competitions from the British newspaper archive. And there's a plot from 1860 to 1900. And the winning distance of competitions, you can see somewhere around 100 yards, uh, maxing out at about 120 yards. And that seems fairly consistent. But there were some long throws recorded. W.G. Grace, a famous early cricketer, threw 117 yards at the Oval, a cricket ground in London. Ross Mackenzie threw 140 yards and nine inches in Toronto. King Billy, the Ab Aborigine, about whom we know nothing else, threw 140 yards at Claremont in Queensland. W.H. Game of Oxford University threw 127 yards, one foot and three inches in 1873. In 1876, W. Forbes threw 132 yards at the Eton College Sports Day. And in Dundee in 1882, A. McKellar threw 130 yards, one foot and six inches. So you can see winning distances were in the 130 and maybe even the 140 yard range. And Crane threw 128 yards, 10 inches somewhere in Australia. How reliable all these measurements were, it's hard to say. There were variants of the game. You could throw with and without the wind and your aggregate uh, length would be recorded. You could throw with both hands, one at a time, of course, and your left hand throw and your right hand throw would be added together. You could throw from the top of a barrel or in a barrel, and this would stop you taking a run, of course. So it would be from a, force you to do a standing start. And as with other such sports, you, they could, there could be handicap variants of, these game, of the event as well. If we look at the frequency, though, of throwing the cricket ball from the British newspaper archives, again from the 1850s through to the 1930s, 1940s, we can see that it rapidly fell off in popularity. Uh, so that by the 1940s, 1950s, it didn't really exist as an adult sport, although it lingered on as a child sports day sport until the 1960s and 1970s. Why should this be the case? You see, I've always thought that throwing the cricket ball was quite a natural sport. It's a quite natural to see how far you can throw a ball. So why did it decline? Well, perhaps because it wasn't a stadium sport. The throws are too long for most stadia. The technique was specialised, not the same as an actual cricket, throwing a cricket ball in a game. And it wasn't included in the Olympics. Uh, and there's Baron Pierre de Coubertin, the originator of the Olympics and the Athens Olympic Stadium. He very much centred upon the classical sports and throwing the cricket ball wasn't a classical sport. Perhaps that's the reason it went out of favour. At the time I gave this presentation, it was during the time of the 2024 Olympics and the people, instead of watching my presentation, could have been watching boxing, 3x3 three three basketball, BMX racing or swimming. So I was gratified that they chose to come to the dinner and listen to me. So let's move on to Robert Percival. His beginnings are shrouded in a bit of mystery, depending upon what information you look at. He was born in Sunderland, Ulston, West Auckland or Northstead. They're all up in the northeast of England, uh, an industrialised area. And uh, Robert was, in essence, a coal miner. Um, and you can see some industrial scenes from up in that area um, at that, around that time. He was the winner of over 40 cricket ball throwing events and also wrestling events. He was five foot 10 inch tall, uh, clearly something of a sportsman, uh, well built. We know a little bit about him. He was married to Mary. He had six children. He was a professional at New Brighton Cricket Club. And that word professional is important. He got paid for the sport. This made him less than respectable in the eyes of many. He was a groundsman to Liverpool Police Athletic Society. Uh, he returned after that to being a coal miner, coal hewer, 
and as so many did in that era, he died in South Shields in the north of England of bronchopneumonia, uh, coal mining induced illness in 1918. So let's think about the Durham Sands event. The Durham Sands area still exists and you can see there some pictures of students on the large area of green, people playing cricket, an old picture of a cricket game in the top right. And it's also used for large meetings such as the Durham Miners Gala as well. So it still serves a purpose. And there you can see it's a very attractive place. And there you can see in the background Durham Cathedral and Durham Castle. In topological terms, it sits right next to the river in Durham, the River Weir. Uh, it's 15.6 acres or 6.3 hectares. Uh, and it's a large flat area next to the river. These days, it's much more surrounded by houses than it was at that point. Uh, the date, first of all, is, is an issue to think about. The early wisdoms give the date as Easter Monday, 1884. Crick Info gives the date as Easter Monday, April the 18th, 1882. Easter Monday in 1882 was actually on April the 10th, so that wasn't, that wasn't the case. But Easter Monday in 1881 was on April the 18th. And in the event is described in the Durham County Advertiser of April the 22nd, 1881. So we can be fairly certain the event happened in 1881. We're told in the report of the goings on at the Durham Sands Racecourse that day, the day was bitterly cold with a keen easterly wind. The shows, roundabouts and shooting galleries and quadrille bands provided pleasure to a number of young people who indulged in dancing and no doubt much else otherwise. No space had been fenced off to decide the various competitions, so it was all a bit chaotic. And there were a lot of competitions, all that prize money for winners between seven shillings and sixpence and a pound, a flat race for horses above 14 hands, a 300 yard race, a flat race uh, for ponies below 14 hands again at 300 yards, very tight track, a hurdle race for horses and a donkey race. And for people, there were a 220 yard flat race, quits, high leap, 220 yard hurdle race, the long leap, pole vault, putting the stone, one mile walking competition, 100 yard boys race, mountain bank races, carrying someone in your back, open flat race and throwing the cricket ball. And the results of the latter are given in the Durham County Advertiser. First, seven shillings and sixpence prize money, Percival. Second, three shillings, Nat. And there were five competitors. The sportsman in 1889 said the event took place on Easter Monday 1884 and the throw was measured by a committee. The sporting record, a few years later, it's been claimed by R. Percival that he threw 141 yards at Durham Racecourse in 1884, but this is regarded as so doubtful that few authorities even mention it. But clearly Robert remembered it. Wiston, 1908, first mentioned it, but attributed it to someone called Richard Percival. They got his name wrong. So was it possible? Was the throw possible? And here we do a little bit of aerodynamics. It was, after all, an aerodynamics conference I was talking to. The cricket ball, when it's thrown, has a number of forces on it. It can have the force due to air resistance, it can have a force that causes it to swing, and that's because of differential boundary layer development around the side of the cricket ball. Aerodynamics will, aerodynamicists will know what I'm talking about. And it can also have a force due to spin. I'm only really going to be thinking about the force due to air resistance. And that can vary depending upon the state of the ball. At the start of the game, cricket balls are new and shiny. At the end of the game, when they've been used quite a lot, hit hard, hit the ground, they can be very soft and scuffed and rough. If you really want to know a little more about the other 
ways in which cricket balls can move through the air, then some people have even written papers on it and you can go away and look at them. The important thing though is about the cricket ball is that it's thrown at a range, a range of Reynolds numbers, again aerodynamicists amongst you will know what that means, uh, that leads to the cricket ball going through the drag crisis, the drag coefficient falling or rising as the speed increases or decreases. And that drag coefficient is at, at the, when it changes from the high old ball drag coefficient to the low new ball drag coefficient depends very much on the state of the ball. An uh, old cricket ball, we drag coefficient will drop off at a much lower Reynolds number. Now the Reynolds number of course is proportional to velocity. So what's that saying is the faster you throw the speed, the lower the, the ball, the lower the drag coefficient. And that's quite important. And that's important when you're trying to calculate how far a cricket ball can be thrown. Basically, old cricket balls have lower drag crisis Reynolds number than new balls. For high trajectories and high initial speeds, the ball passes through the drag crisis on both the way up and on the way down. In general, old balls travel further than new balls. And for long throws, balls need a javelin-like trajectory, throwing like something like 40, 45, 50 degrees. So this, this can all be calculated fairly straightforwardly. You can use, again, in aerodynamics terms, the compact debris equations to do that. And here I plotted the throwing speed against the length of the throw. And you can see that for a throwing speed of 90 miles an hour, uh, the new ball can be thrown about 100 yards, the old ball about 120 yards, and those figures increase for 100 mile an hour. Now, those throwing speeds are important. Most cricket fast bowlers, the international ones, would sort of top out at 90 miles an hour. Major League Baseball players who don't have quite the re requirements of accuracy as cricket bowlers uh, can go at 100 or more miles an hour when they pitch the ball. So 100 mile an hour throws are possible. Now, we were told there was a bitterly cold easterly wind speed. And so let's think a bit about what wind speed might do to it. What I've done there is plotted the throwing speed against the wind speed at 10 meters height uh, for different lengths of throw. And you can see that as um, the wind speed increases for any particular length of throw you need a lower throwing speed which is what one might expect and the average english wind speed is about four meters a second and that can make quite a difference roughly 120 to 140 yard throw uh, between 90 and 100 miles an hour so it looks like the calculations suggest that wind speed might be quite important but can we say any more about the wind speed on the day? Well, rather wonderfully, we can, because the race scores we can see in the top right of the picture was actually quite close to Durham Observatory in the bottom left. And Durham Observatory still exists. It's the oldest, or it claims to be the oldest, continually uh, measuring uh, of weather, wind, rainfall observatory in the world, and it's been measuring since before. 1880. So we do actually have a world, uh, a weather record for that day. And at 10 o'clock in the morning, the morning observation on that day, the wind speed was 30 miles an hour, six meters a second from the northeast, not quite from the east, with, uh, and that's an average speed, of course, gust winds can be much higher than that. So what could they do to the throw of a cricket ball? Well, if we're throwing it at uh, if there's a wind speed of six meters a second, the average wind speed, and you throw it at 94 miles an hour, you get a 140 yard throw. Uh, if there's a wind speed of nine meters a second, so that's a gust factor of 1.5, um, they require throwing speed for a 140 yard throw is somewhere around 91 miles an hour. So these are all now in the quite possible range. But what was the direction of the throw? Now, if you look at the map, 
as far as I can see, the most likely place in which the competition took place is marked by that red line. It's not obstructing the entrance to the exit of the ground. It avoids the crowds in the centre of the race course, which is always a good idea because the cricket ball can do damage. And of course, it's well away from the river, which is also an advantage. Uh, so I think the most likely direction in which a ball was thrown was actually in a northeast southwest direction. Uh, in other words, just the direction with which it could have benefited from uh, the prevailing winds on the day. But two questions come to my mind. Why hasn't the throw been reproduced? Well, because of lack of throwing specialists. There have been claims over recent years uh, that some athletes, particularly javelin throwers, have been able to get close uh, with their particular technique. Why was there such a reluctance to accept the record? And here I think class entered into it. Percival wasn't regarded as a gentleman. He wasn't regarded as respectable in an era when the claim was thoroughly ridden with class considerations. But was the throw possible? Well, I think there's a prima facie case that Percival was one of the best throwers of the age and could have thrown 120 yards in still air at speeds, uh, throwing speeds of over 90 miles an hour. I think that's quite possible. The weather was such there might have been considerable wind assistance on the day of the Durham Sands event. Calculations indicate that a distance of 140 yards could be achieved with a 94 mile an hour throw and a tailwind of 6 metres a second or a 91 mile an hour throw with a tailwind of 9 metres a second. The most likely throw direction was the same as the wind direction. But conditions on the day were chaotic and not conducive to accurate measurements. And one might ask, what is the relevance of a world record anyway, where wind conditions are so significant? So, was the throw possible? Well, it has to be your choice. What I would, how I would answer that question is, I think I would say, yes, it was possible. I think the world record is credible and probably needs to be taken seriously. But I don't think, of course, at this distance from the events of 150 years or more, uh, almost, uh, we can actually prove it one way or another. Thank you very much indeed for listening to this presentation and I hope you enjoyed it.